speed training is one of my favorite topics to talk about to coaches, but also it's one of my favorite skills to teach my players. So I'm really excited today to be presenting on speed training for the soccer player. And I presented on this topic at the United Coaches Convention in Philadelphia, and it was shocking for a lot of people in the audience because a lot of the concepts in this presentation coaches haven't heard about before. And there's a lot of misconceptions with speed training, especially in the soccer community. And it's really hindering our players from really turning into explosive athletes. And it's also hurting them from an injury reduction standpoint that we aren't doing speed training correctly. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I, I hope it impacts you and changes your mind on some things. The agenda for today is we'll first talk about where speed is in the game of soccer and why it is so critical to prioritize it. And then we'll go over some current problems in speed development and why people are getting it wrong. And then some solutions at the end of the presentation, some solutions for coaches to implement within practice and even players to just do on their own time because it is really easy to implement within the schedule because it doesn't take that long to train speed. And then how do we maximize player development? And player development is more than just skills training and tactical training where kids are at their team practices, but it's also physical. So how do we maximize all of those buckets in training? Before I get into the meat of the presentation, I need to give credit where credit is due here. And a lot of my inspiration for my speed training with my soccer players and what I try to share with coaches is it came from the track community and for obvious reasons, because the track coaches train some of the fastest athletes in the world. And the guys I have listed here are absolute legends in the track community and guys who have been mentoring me from afar. So first Tony Holler, he is the creator of the feed the cats program. If you haven't heard about it, I highly recommend you check it out. I, I am including his links in the description below, but Tony really got my wheels spinning a few years ago when I heard him on a podcast and he completely changed my mind about speed training for soccer players. And then uh, Graham Eaton, also a great track coach, Brendan Thompson, track coach, as well as physical therapist. And then Mike Whiteman is an honorary track professional, but he actually is a soccer performance coach who is one of my favorite soccer speed guys. He's the director of performance at the Pittsburgh Riverhounds for the ECNL boys and girls teams, as well as the first teams. So shout out to these guys for influencing my speed training and some of the ideas that you're going to see within this presentation. First, let's go over speed in the game. So when I was presenting at the coaches convention, I asked everyone in the audience, to describe their best player from a physical standpoint. And at first people in the audience said fit <laughs> and that was way too vague. So I told them to be more specific. So then they started to get into their best players being explosive, fast, powerful, strong. So it makes sense. The, the best players that we watch in soccer are the most dynamic. They're, they're the ones who really impact the game, score goals, save goals, and just make the game exciting. They make the game electric. So they're all fast. They're all explosive. So some of the world's fastest, when we, we look at these professional uh, men's soccer players, they run at well over a 21 mile per hour. And I would say most men's players are above that and above 20 mile per hour. And then when we look at the world's fastest, uh, Kristen Press is also above uh, a 20 mile per hour. 
And then Denise O'Sullivan as well, above a 20 mile per hour top end speed. And what's interesting about all these players on the men's and women's side, yes, they're all highly skilled players. They have a good soccer IQ, but when you put them next to their opponents, the one thing that gives them the edge is their speed. And soccer is a game where most of players are moving off the ball. It's a very small percentage of the game where the players have the ball at their feet. So let's take a look at where speed is in the game of soccer. And I'd argue it's extremely important and it's the difference between a win and a loss. So I have this compilation of highlight videos from some of my high school female soccer players. So let's take a look. So we can see in these videos that speed is involved in counterattacks, in 1v1s, blasting past defenders, making that separating touch to beat a defender and take a shot. So speed is involved in the game's most game-changing moments, but that should be fairly obvious. And Yes, I'm interested in that and and we train for that, but I'm more interested in how much more efficient fast players are compared to slow players. And usually slow players will let their team down in the final minutes because they're not efficient with their movement and they're co covering useless mileage. And Tony Strudwick, who is the former performance coach of Manchester United and head of sports science in his book, soccer science, he presents a lot of research on GPS data and comparing teams that covered more miles as opposed to teams that didn't cover a lot of miles in games. And what the research found was that the teams that covered more miles were actually the teams that lost. So they were, they were more tired because they were just expending useless energy and making runs that weren't even efficient or contributing to the most game-changing actions. So it begs the question, what are the most important qualities in soccer? And I'd argue speed being one of them, but also being a fast thinker. And we're going to get into that later in this presentation, but it's going to be extremely crucial for soccer players to train both being fast movers and fast thinkers. So if they're fast movers, they make those high intensity runs count and they use them in moments that matter and they're not wasting their energy. And if they have a high soccer IQ and they're fast thinkers, they're also going to expend less energy and be able to recover more during the game because they're very smart with their body position and the first touch they're taking and the decisions they're making and, and the passes they're making. So it's important to have both speed and then the cognitive component of soccer. Those are some of the most efficient soccer players in the world. So why are we ruining our youth soccer players' speed development? Well, there's a plethora of problems in the youth soccer community at the moment. So let's just run through them. So the first one is the speed bucket is empty or it's not getting filled as much as the other buckets. So I like to divide the buckets of soccer into the different energy systems. So we have the aerobic energy system, anaerobic, and then speed and power. So aerobic is more of our long distance running. We're hitting about 60 to 70% of our max heart rate. And usually this is happening within technical drills and maybe some small sided games. But the aerobic bucket is I want you to think about you doing light intensity exercise where you can still carry on a conversation. So that's more of the aerobic work. And 
if kids are practicing three to four times a week, that bucket is more than full. The anaerobic is more our medium to medium to high intensity work. So that's within the small sided games. And that's when players are reaching an 80 to 85% of maximum heart rate. So still very tough to do an exercise and carry on a conversation. So those are more of your lung burning conditioning drills. And then our, our speed and power. So this is when we start to tap into the CP ATP energy system. And this is when we're doing our sprints and jumps that last less than six to 12 seconds, but for speed, it should be a less than six second drill. And these drills are done at maximum intensity. And when you look at a practice, you rarely see players doing a six second high effort drill and then resting long. They're usually doing their technical work, small sided games. So the speed and power buck is very empty within soccer players. And we've actually researched this. So I recently started using the beyond pulse GPS sensor with my U 16 girls. And what's happening is they're covering about four to six miles in a game. And the majority of the time they are in an aerobic zone. Uh, the orange zone, the anaerobic zone is the second second one. And then the red zone is, is the third one that they're in, but they're not spending a lot of time doing high speed running or those really short explosive bouts. But when they are, that's when the game's changed. So I don't want you to think that just because they're not spending a lot of time in there, we shouldn't train it. We absolutely should train it because that's where goals are scored. So we, we looked at this data and the percentage of the light to moderate running, the aerobic to anaerobic was about 95 to 97% of the practice at game week. So that's, that's highly concerning. The, the second issue, and this is the one that most people get wrong, and this is what got everyone's ears perked up in the presentation, is speed is a separate drill from conditioning. And just coming back to the energy systems, we need to think about the energy systems like a manual car. So if you are listening and you don't drive a manual car, or maybe you grew up in a time where we all were driving manual cars. That's what I learned on. It's pretty, pretty easy to nail down. So you can only be in one gear at a time. So your first gear is your slowest gear. And I would say that would be comparable to your aerobic work. And then your third gear or fourth gear would be anaerobic work. And then your fifth gear would be power. And then your sixth gear, your fastest gear would be speed, but you can't be in first and sixth gear at the same time. You're either going slow or you're either going fast. So I want you to be able to distinguish what is a speed drill as opposed to what is a conditioning drill. And they're, they both are valuable, but they need to be trained separately within a separate drill or on a different day. The second problem, and this one has gotten worse and worse as I have continued my career in the youth soccer space, I'm going on my 11th year of coaching, and I've concluded that most kids are overscheduled. So back in the day when I was growing up, kids were practicing maybe twice a week on Tuesday and Thursday, and then one game on the weekend, but now you see even U12 teams practicing three to four days a week and worse yet, they're adding on in-season skills training on what should actually be their off day. And then the following day they have a game. So hopefully Sunday's off. Usually that is the case in the average schedule, but I've seen some instances where Sunday they might schedule another skills training session, or maybe there's two games that weekend. So you really need to ask, when do these kids have time to recover? Because in order to get a good speed adaptation, there needs to be off days so kids can recover and prepare for a quality speed session. In this case, less ends up being more. And the fourth one is 
there's just not enough performance coaches at clubs. And even if there are, they only work with the ECNL teams or maybe just the the U16s to U18s, but then everyone else has to fend for themselves. And I realized that I'm a luxury as a speed and performance coach and not everyone can afford it. But what's happening is clubs are allocating their budget on things that aren't necessary, especially if it's added skills and technical nights. And look, I'm not I'm not hating on skills trainers. I think there's a time and place, but when there's just too much overlap of the soccer specific and not enough of the physical development, that's when people aren't getting value out of those club dues. We have to remember that the complete player is technical, tactical, and physical. And the last one, I would say this is probably a bigger problem than (laughs) the overscheduled. I think they're pretty equal, but the internet and When I Googled soccer speed training for this presentation, the first several images that came up were kids tapping their feet through ladders, young kids attached to parachutes. Nowhere in there did I see a kid running over 20 meter max velocity sprint with someone timing them. So the the problem is the internet is blasting all this information about speed training that is misinformation. And the the soccer community tries to get really cute with speed just to put on a show. And, you know, honestly, I get it. I mean, I could make a fortune doing this nonsense. I could make $100 an hour being a quote unquote soccer speed coach on Instagram and just having kids run through ladders. Anyone can make a kid run through a ladder. And anyone can do these filler exercises that aren't training speed. They're actually overtraining the kid in more sport specific movements. And they're not getting kids in not only a sprint stimulus, but they're not teaching them true sprinting technique. You can't really teach true sprinting technique with all this added equipment. You need less equipment and you need to teach them how to strike the ground with their foot. They're their posture, how it should be upright, how the core should be stable. So the internet has completely lied and duped soccer parents and coaches to thinking that speed sessions, the kids should constantly be using equipment and it should look like a circus. And it's, it's really sad, but that's why I'm trying to get the message out there so that we can really raise the ceiling on our kids' speed development and give them what they need not the the show that they want to have put on. And I've lost clients in, in all honesty. I've lost clients because they look at my speed sessions and they're like, oh my gosh, there's so much standing around. Like our kid is not even getting a workout. Well, my question is, do you want your kid to develop speed or not? Because speed development requires a lot of rest time. So here are the solutions, and we're going to really get into what speed training actually looks like. And this, again, is all inspired by the track community, the guys who train speed and the fastest athletes year-round. I am going to lean in and listen to those guys because they know what they're talking about. So every speed trail must be less than six seconds of max effort. If you get above that six seconds, that's when we start to get into more our alactic and anaerobic conditioning. Again, we can do those. We can train that to prepare for the demands of conditioning in soccer, but there's done separately. So we're going to run a sprint or do a jump or do a mechanical drill for less than six seconds with our max effort. So we should be exhausted after we run an over 20 meter sprint. Athletes should need that several minute rest. That's how hard they're going. It's the highest possible output they can train their central nervous system to fire. Speed must also be done fresh. And this comes back to the central nervous system. It takes a lot for the central nervous system to fire and for kids to really 
get that adaptation of being twitchy and explosive. So we can't be doing a speed session the day after a game. They're they're not going to be able to give that quality output and that high intensity output. Tired is not the goal in speed session. So if you're observing a quote unquote speed session from Instagram and you see constant movement for the full hour is not speed training. So tired is not the goal. We want to train the central nervous system. And usually speed sessions should be 45 minutes or less. Sometimes mine are even less than that, but we're only doing a couple minutes of true hard work. We want to reach over 20 meters in our sprint. So anything less than that is going to be more of our acceleration and uh, quote unquote first step work. That's what a lot of people call acceleration in the soccer community. So it's okay to do less than 20 meters, but just know that that's more you're creating uh, horizontal force in your acceleration. But when we reach over 20 meters, that's when we start to reach our top end speed and we get to raise the ceiling on our mile per hour number. And then Tony Holler always says uh, these three are the most important in speed training. You want to sprint fast, jump far, and jump high. So sprint fast, we've already discussed. Jump far, that means we are creating horizontal force and really working on a good acceleration. And then we want to jump high to really work on our vertical force production and ground contacts. And then we also want to rest long. So in between speed drills, we're resting for five minutes or more. And and, an athlete could feel like, you know, they could go again and do a sprint again in 60 seconds after a sprint effort. But what happens is the, the ATP, so if we're looking at the cellular level, the ATP takes longer to replenish. So that's why we, we take a five minute rest time, usually between those sprint efforts And then for our jumps and our mechanical drills, we're resting about a minute. So a a new idea, and this is something that I've been going back and forth with, with some of the track guys, and they've started to implement it for the past two years. I've started to implement this with my athletes in the past year, and it's to give them a speed workout as warm up to their practice. And Every speed workout should be like an in-season one should be 10 to 15 minutes. So the one I'm going to share is definitely under 15 minutes. So you can get to practice early and make speed a priority. So I recommend doing it at least twice a week. But if you're in season and you need more recovery, then once a week is enough to get started and to just make small improvements and maintain But once you get into the off season, I recommend two to three times a week speed training. If you look at Saturday or Sunday, if there's a game, non-starters should still be doing something. So since they're not playing a lot of minutes, we still want to expose them to high intensity running so that when they do go into the game, eventually they're still well conditioned and they're explosive. The reason why I am toying with the idea of having coaches permanently change their warm up is because the warm ups I see in the soccer community are not potentiating our players, which means they're not really charging their batteries. So they're going through just super light jogs, or maybe they're doing a high knee drill that isn't a true high knees and it's just very half in, it's very low quality movement. It's not intense enough. And it begs the question, well, what are, what are they really getting out of this warm up? And I had coaches tell me, well, the warm up raises the heart rate. It gets the blood flowing, the muscles warm. Great. Well, so does a 10 minute speed workout. Then they start to nod their head. And then they say, well, like, we need a stretch. Like when did that injure them? Let me tell you a fun fact. Youth soccer players are not tight. They're weak. They don't get enough high intensity stimulus. They don't speed and power train enough. They don't strength train enough. They are not tight. They're weak. They're not powerful. So 
if I really want to improve performance and reduce injury, I want to do a speed warm up because speed is one of the best hamstring firing things an athlete can do. And we all know that the hamstrings are very important for injury reduction and for, for ACLs. So is your warm up potentiating your players? So if you're thinking about implementing a new speed warm up, it's very simple. We microdose it. So microdosing means we just add in something small enough to give them a stimulus so they improve their speed, but not big enough that we're exhausting or getting our players sore for practice. Coming back to how tired's not the goal. A speed workout should charge the batteries. It should fire the central nervous system and it should actually make athletes feel awake. And that's the one thing my athletes in Tampa, Florida will tell me about our speed workouts is they always feel energized. And I totally get it. I've done speed workouts myself as an adult who's in her thirties. I do them first thing in the day and I'm ready for the day. So when we're doing eight movements that are three to five seconds in length, high intensity, but we're resting long in between, we're going to wake up. We're going to be ready for practice. So microdosing speed means we're being efficient with low duration, minimal movements, but high intensity. And the intensity, again, the goal is to excite the central nervous system. This is not a slow aerobic workout. This is not a slow jog warm up. This is not uh, a terrible high knee drill where girls aren't even getting their knees up and going fast enough. We are trying to be as intense as possible within this short warm up. Okay, so we are at the drills and Again, the high knees <laughs> are always butchered. And uh, these girls are in their first few months of speed training, true speed training. And I'm a stick stickler for form. So we got them at a point where they are keeping good speed on the high knees for five seconds as fast as they can. So that's how it should be done. After five seconds, that's when we start to slow down and we don't get the benefits for the central nervous system. I'm going to go over form a little bit more here, but a few things to point out. We want their uh, knee and foot in the front. Um, usually with players, soccer players, their foot lags behind the hips. And that actually slows them down because they're not able to strike the ground with the ball of the foot. So we want the knee and the foot in the front and we want upright posture. So if, if posture is not upright enough, that just goes down the chain and it turns our athletes into toe runners potentially, and just not striking the ground as best we can show you guys one more time and notice how all their eyes are forward, eyes forward, chin up, big heart. You want them to be as tall as they can. And again, for a soccer player. This is a very unnatural position because the buckets that are being filled in practice are technical drills within a small space. So they're, they're hunched over or they're on their toes, or they got like that soft knee bend athletic stance. And that's great for soccer. But when we want to get them out of a position to train top speed, we want to get them tall. We want to really train them proper sprint mechanics. So we need to fill that bucket and we need to be as repetitive with this as we are soccer skill work because speed is a skill and it really takes time to learn running form. Even with these girls, I'm so nitpicky. I can say 10 things wrong with their form right now that we're still working on. <laughs> so it's always a journey. It's a long-term journey to train speed. Okay, now we're in our jump. So this is coming back to Tony Holler's uh, jump far. We do a three broad jump for distance. And I like this because we're, we're working on good ground contacts, but there's also an injury reduction component to this. 
And we're having them really stick their landing and recruit their glutes and their hamstrings when they're landing. Okay, the next one skips. So this is just adding more rhythm. Our our high knee drill is more for, for speed, but rhythm is a part of speed, rhythm and balance and coordination. So we do our skipping drills. Same idea. We want the knee and the foot in front. And we want posture tall, heart big, heart forward is something that I usually cue with. Remember, we will do this drill. We'll do all these drills for about three to five seconds. And then we'll rest for a minute. So after these skips, we do a minute rest. Then we move on to the next. So more hop drills. So we're trying to just mimic the fast ground contact time that's in a sprint and really get our players comfortable with hitting the ground with the ball of the foot and being springy off the ground. I honestly have all age groups do pogo hops, lateral hops, front to back hops. It's great for all ages. My middle schoolers do it and my high school girls do it. So the pogo hops, we want to stay as straight as possible. And again, um, we, we want to go for speed. So as many ground contacts as possible, and I'll have the girls compete on this. I'll put five seconds on the clock and they have to count how many hops they get in that time. And we compete as a group. Same with these lateral hops, five seconds on the clock, count how many ground contacts you get. The more, the better because that means you're going fast. Okay, so we'll rest for 60 seconds. Then we move on. Prime times, I got this one from Graham Eaton. So he was a track guy that I listed earlier in this presentation. I believe Tony Holler does these as well. And Mike Whiteman, I mean, I think they all do them. They're track guys. Um, but I like prime times because we're recruiting the hamstring more and we're really training that foot to just stay in front. And the, the coordination on these is harder than a high knee. It's uh, again, it's a very unnatural position, but it really pushes them to have that opposite arm and leg coordination while also keeping their speed. I have them count how many they get in this as well. So we put the timer on and they count how many kicks forward they do. Rest for 60 seconds. I know it's a lot of standing around, but hey, at least we all get to socialize. At least we get to enjoy the day. I think the issue with speed is people get impatient. And that's one of the, the biggest questions I get and that I got at the convention is, well, can we just juggle a soccer ball in between the, these efforts? Why? Why do you want to ruin the next drill? Even if it's a light activity, we're, we're still working and we want to make sure that we're optimizing the next drill the best we can. And the only way to do that and to keep that intensity on the next drill is to stand around and rest. I don't know what happened with our culture, the constant need to be busy and moving around. I think it's just, we all are just indoctrinated to constantly be stimulated. And I get it. We all succumb to it at times, but do you really want to develop speed? Do you really want to build twitchy athletes? Then take your rest time. And we use this as a great opportunity to catch up. How's school going? What summer vacations do you have planned? We just socialize or we enjoy our surroundings and the sun and nature. And that's always a good thing. One of my girls texts me that one of her coaches is trying to implement these workouts. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so awesome. I'm so glad he's doing that. That's amazing. And she was like, yeah, it's great. But he could learn a thing or two about taking longer rest times because we're not resting long enough. And I was like, that's my girl. <laughs> you get on him about that. But I get it. Coaches want to make it look like we're constantly working, but the best work is quality work. And quality work happens when we recover. Next, now we do our 10 yard accelerations. The track guys will do just regular track starts. 
sometimes I'll do them, but I like to mix it up. We'll start from a plank position. We might start from chest to ground, or maybe we'll start with a side shuffle and then turn and sprint into a 10 yard. I just like to mix it up just to add some variety. And I think there's, you know, there's no hindrance to that, to doing that. And I think we can give our players some variety, but these are fun. They're always competitive and the girls love them. Okay, now we're on to our top end speed sprint. So this is the last drill that we'll do. And it is one of the most crucial to get in. It's that top end speed exposure and getting your mile per hour number, how fast you can run in miles per hour. So I was able to get a top view of this so you guys could better see because I got a lot of questions on what the run-in looks like. But usually our, our run-ins, we start 20 meters out. So you see these two cones here. These are the timing cones that I use. I use the free lap timing system. And if you're interested in getting one, I included a link in the caption below. I'll talk about that soon here in detail, but we're start we're starting 20 meters out and we're starting at about a 50% sprint. So we'll go like 50% sprint. And then as we get closer to that first timing cone, we're starting to really pick up our speed. So we're getting into a 75%, 85, 95. And then as soon as we hit that timing cone, we're going full 100%. So it usually takes 20 meters or more to get that top speed, which is why we place the timing cones out here. So here's the full drill. My run and I sprinted pretty fast, but I think there could have been a better build up there. Let me do it again. So 20 meter run in, and then you hit that timing cone and you're going full speed. So that's the 10 meter fly. You'll do two of those. And in between those two, you want to rest longer. So usually we do a five minute rest for that ATP to replenish and for players to get the full recovery because we want the, the two sprints to, yes, we want them to optimize how we're training the central nervous system. And we want to make sure that the two sprints are very close in time to the millisecond. I've had players who will who were like, okay, well, I want to run my 10 meter fly in my second 10 meter fly after a 60 second rest. And I'm like, okay, let's try it. Let's see what happens. And their, their second set is so slow and they get mad. And I just nod my head. I'm like, that's why. So we want to make every sprint count and we want to go as fast as we can for every set. So make sure you're doing that five minute rest time. Please don't juggle the soccer ball in between. Please don't do burpees. Please don't have hit circuit set up on the side. Rest, stand around. I explained this concept to my mom. My mom is not a soccer person. She's not an exercise science person. She's actually a concert pianist. She has a PhD in music theory. So that's my mom. She's awesome. But I explained this concept to her and I said, I am always getting pushback from soccer coaches that we need to train speed with the ball. And my mom goes, why the heck would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. You can't go as fast with the ball at your feet. And I was like, mom, nailed it. <laughs> so guys, take it from my mom. <laughs> but it, let, let's look here. So let's look at optimal body mechanics for sprinting. So the, the picture on the right, we want an, a totally upright posture, a higher knee lift, the foot in the front, because that's what gets the best vertical force production and the fastest ground contacts. So we can be running at our fastest. But, you know, if we had the ball at our feet, we would look more like the, the guy on the left we would be too lean forward. The knee wouldn't be high enough because we're trying to dribble the ball and we wouldn't, we definitely wouldn't be striking the ground the best we can with the ball, the foot, we would be actually running more on our toes, which is terrible for improving speed. Now 
we experimented with this. Uh, let me actually move back. So we experimented with this and we had a girl race with the ball, girl without the ball. And obviously the girl without the ball won. And it's funny because the girl who won her mile per hour was above an 18 mile per hour. That's division one speed. The girl with the ball barely hit a 10 mile per hour. If you have the ball at your feet, it's impossible to speed train. It's impossible to raise the ceiling on your mile per hour number. So the question you want to ask yourself is, what adaptation do you want out of the drill you're creating? So if you want to train top end speed, no ball. But if you want to train maybe speed dribbling, then that's a separate drill. So I'm not saying that you can't train with the ball. You absolutely can. But the adaptation that you're getting out of that drill is totally different than speed. So as Tony Holler would say, and I filed this one away, let speed train speed. We're supplementing it with soccer training. And we're going to let soccer train soccer. And we're going to do that within small sided games. And we condition our players through small sided games by setting up certain pitch dimensions, numbers on the field, work to rest times. And I put in this graphic, the, the lowest intensity to the highest intensity small sided game. But keep in mind that Small sided games also become intense by the coach being engaging in them and really getting on the players, really being exuberant and not just standing there like a stoic coach. Coaches can really dictate the energy and the intensity of the small sided game. I've had this conversation with Steve Rollins, and if there's a stoic coach just standing there and saying, Well, if we play a 1v1 in a 10 by 5 pitch, then yeah, it's going to be intense. But you could have players jogging during that. But you have to find a way to be engaged and to get the most out of your players. You can't just be standing there. So what I like about small sided games is we get we get soccer specific. Okay, we we do get a little bit of speed dribbling on the ball. We get some explosiveness off the ball. We get the cognitive load within a small sided game. We get tactical decision making and we get the conditioning effect. So it's a great bang for buck if we program our small sided games correctly within practice. And at the beginning of practice, we do our speed warm up. You can accomplish a lot in just a 90 minute practice doing both of these things. You're going to train fast movers and fast thinkers in that practice. So really look at how you're programming out your practice. Are we making the most use of time? Are we filling appropriate buckets or are we just doing filler exercises? And I would go as far as to say that most teams do not need to add conditioning runs at the end. You don't need to do shuttle runs or suicides or laps around the field. You need to program your small sided games better and you need to do speed training. That's more worth it to me. Okay. So player development, this is something that is on every mission statement. I would say most of them for youth soccer clubs. And I think the intention's good. I think most soccer clubs are genuine and want to develop players, but I think the term has become so vague and there's not enough value being presented to parents and there's just not enough objective data coming. And when we talk about development, we mean to improve something. And the only thing to know if we improve something is if it's been measured. So from a speed standpoint, we have to track speed. So that means we have to time every sprint and we have to know what our player's baseline is and then show improvement over time. And I've had so many new 
athletes come to me in Tampa who have the end of the year evaluation sheet from their coach. And it says in the physical part of it, you need to improve speed. And I ask, okay, what is your 10 meter fly time? What is your mile per hour? And the girl looks at me like, what's that? And I'm like, no one's measured your speed. So how do they know you need to improve it? Their development is measured. And I believe that most kids are motivated extrinsically by the data. I think it definitely is a great tool to get kids excited about speed training. I know my athletes, they love getting that mile per hour number. It's so powerful for them. So the way to get that and the first step to getting the mile per hour number is you have to time every sprint. So the most accurate one I use is the free lap timing system. And I included a link to it in the caption below. When you get it, you do not need a TX Touch Pro. So you just put zero as the option in checkout. But I have had this for several years now, and it's my best friend. <laughs> it's my best friend for my own training and my athletes, because once you bring in the technology, that's when everyone raises their intensity. It's pretty amazing. Sometimes I see intensity go higher than if we're racing. But when kids are racing against the technology, it's a different story, and it's incredible. So free top timing system. You probably click the link below and you're like, well, that's not cheap. <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, if you're a club coach, you're in the ECNL, GA, or a smaller travel club, in the grand scheme of things, it's not that expensive. Look at your club's budget. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe thousands of dollars. You can invest in a free lap timing system and you can cut some other things out of your expense list. You might need to cut some technical nights. I don't know. That's up to you. But you need to ask, is is the speed bucket being filled? And if it's not, then cut back on something in the expenses and then get a free lap. In the grand scheme of things, it's not that much money for big clubs. And I'd say some small clubs, if you're smart about budging and spending on the right things. A team unit, I believe, is three to 4,000. But what I've seen a lot of coaches do is they they share it within several teams. So it's not like every team has to buy one of these. It's it's passed around within the club, which can also be very useful. I've had remote athletes split one together and that's been really useful as well. So you just have to get creative with it and just be smart about where you're investing and how you're allocating your money. So when you have your timing cones, and again, I can't reiterate enough how important it is to have timing technology because stopwatch time or hand timing on your phone is so incredibly in inaccurate. And I've had 12 year old girls tell me that they can run a 20 mile per hour. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't mean to crush your dreams, but I know your hand timing. So let's try and find out if we can get you a timing system or if we can look at your improvements with that modality, but just know that that mile per hour is not the most accurate it can be. So to get the mile per hour number is you're going to get the time between these two timing cones. So they're 10 meters apart and you're going to do 22.37 divided by a 10 meter fly time. So I have several girls who are at a, a 1.15 10 meter fly. So if we do 22.37 divided by a 1.15 second 10 meter fly, that's a 19.4 mile per hour. So that's college speed. That's D1, D1 college speed. So that's how you get that number. And just realize that the, the mile per hour is going to improve over several months, over several years with the combination of a speed training stimulus and the athlete's natural growth and maturation. So I've seen middle school girls go from a 14 to a 16 mile per hour when they're finally finished their, their growth spurt. 
but they've also supplemented with some good speed training. So it's as much as I want to take credit for their speed improvements, it's also growing into their bodies, getting taller, gaining more muscle, and then maturing into their adult stature. So just know that and know that players will not beat their record every single week. And the the way to combat that is so they don't lose motivation is to show them the average of their improvement over time and to calculate the the average of their mile per hour number. So that's what uh, Mike Whiteman and I were talking about. That's the the average max velocity of all those mile per hours. Um, And then the peak velocity is that personal record. So the highest you have ever reached. And that's the stuff we see on TV when we see professional soccer players reaching their top speed. That's peak velocity. But we want to show our players that they've improved over a long period of time. And that, again, speed takes time and it takes consistency with training over several months and years. I recommend my new clients train with me at least a minimum of three months. And if they're new, they're going to improve that mile per hour pretty quickly since it's a new stimulus to their body. But eventually players reach their peak and in college. And I think I reached mine when I was a senior at Johns Hopkins University. And and that's fine. And that that's what we want, especially if a lot of players want to play in college. We want them peaking in their speed then. So we we do a leaderboard and I I do send this out weekly because we have new athletes coming in, getting new mile per hour records. And this just motivates the girls because some of them are working remotely on their speed program and doing the speed workout 15 minutes before practice. And they're making sure that they get that in. So I have to keep those remote athletes as engaged as possible. So I send this out every Monday and that's because we have new athletes coming in as well. And some of them are are beating these top three out every single week. I get asked about standards a lot. So I have seen most middle schoolers at a 14 mile per hour. Sometimes it's less. Um, a good is a 15 and an excellent is a 15 and a half. Although I've seen some outliers there but those are just a a general start. And then high school, most girls that come to me are at a 15 or 16. So they have a pretty solid base. But then once we start to get to the 17 and then over 18, that's when we get into excellent. And that's more of your, your D1 speed standards. So it's important to have competition within the team, but it's also important to have individual progress shown. And that's because not every player is going to be fast and have good genetics. So player A, she started at a 17.4 mile per hour, and we can say she started with an amazing speed base. And for her, we were able to still improve that. So just because you're born fast and you're blowing by everyone doesn't mean you don't train speed. You still should train speed. There's no such thing as too fast, especially when you get into the higher levels that that mile per hour to 1.5 mile per hour. That's a huge difference. So we still want to train our fast players and not have them just stagnate. And then player B, so she did not get the best speed genetics. And this player actually has two parents who were marathon runners. And it makes sense because that's more aerobic zone, slow twitch muscles. So those were the genes she got. But we were still able to improve for her and the level she was at and the team she was playing on. She was able to improve by over one mile per hour in just six weeks time. So with consistent training, you can make a big difference in six to eight weeks time in just one to a few miles per hour because that stimulus is new. Eventually it will flatten off a little bit, but usually that new stimulus players get excited because they're like, oh my gosh, all I need to do is just sprint fast and do jumps and do mechanics and I can improve this. And I'm like, yeah, (laughs) speed's not hard. It's very simple and anyone can do it, which is why it's so exciting. So a lot of people would say that a one to 1.5 mile per hour is not a big difference, but it absolutely is in the game of soccer. So let's take a look here.
It's a huge difference. And it's the difference between one to two steps ahead of a defender and scoring a goal. These moments are truly game changing. And one thing I do want to point out here, and I'm sure people will have something to say in the comments, they'll say, well, she's speed dribbling on the ball. So why don't we train with her doing that? My argument is if you train to be fast off the ball, you will also be fast on the ball. You can't train this the other way around. You can't train just speed dribbling with the ball and expect to become a faster player who raises the ceiling on their top end speed and mile per hour number. When you're training speed with the ball, you're actually training at about 50% of your max speed, maybe not even. So you're definitely not training the central nervous system. You can do speed dribbling, as I've mentioned earlier in the presentation, but that's a different drill, and that's more of a technical drill than anything, whereas if we train off the ball and we run our max velocity sprints, we will become faster in our speed dribbling on the ball. There's no such thing as too fast because speed improves a lot of things. If you continue to get faster and become more explosive, you improve so much. So the first thing I notice about speed training is athletes look forward to training. They, they enjoy it. And it's probably because speed training doesn't make athletes sore. Tired is not the goal. And they're leaving sessions feeling energized and empowered. Speed also improves team tactics. And we've touched on this earlier in the presentation, counterattacks, movement off the ball, which makes up the majority of soccer, and also being able to make through runs and just get through the lines. It improves so much. If you don't have speed, it's hard to have good team tactics. And again, the teams that lose the most cover more mileage but the teams that win the most have a good soccer IQ but they also know when to make those explosive runs and be smart with them they're more efficient in their movement speed also improves endurance now this is something new that is on the horizon in research but i highly recommend checking out david bishop phd and he talks about how high intensity sprints increase the mitochondria in the cells and also myoglobin in the muscles, which is a protein that delivers oxygen. So there's something to this. And I can definitely say that within my own speed training and my soccer career. Full disclosure, I have never run two miles around the track ever in my career. Played soccer at Johns Hopkins, started all four years, was an All-American and National Midfielder of the Year. Never once ran a two-mile. But what I did do was sprint training since middle school and high-intensity conditioning within small-sided games. Speed also improves acceleration and change of direction. And this is because there's a central nervous system transfer here and acceleration and change of direction are movements that happen in just a few seconds' time. And if we're training speed, max output in a few seconds time, then that's going to carry over into being more explosive in other types of movement. Speed also helps with longevity. And personally, I feel better than I did as a college All-American now because I'm like really focusing on speed training. And I just feel more awake and sharp. And that brings me to the next one. It improves brain function. And that's because speed is one of the most intense coordinated activities the body can do. So there's a ton of intermuscular coordination involved. And that means that the left and right hemispheres of our brain are becoming higher functioning. So definitely, definitely look into this because if you are struggling with being able to be okay during the workday, I highly recommend adding sprints into your regimen. 
Speed also improves injury resiliency. And since we've started to implement speed training into warmups, we've had no issues with soft tissue injury. I've had girls come out of rehab who say that their hamstrings are now bulletproof. And that's because we sprint at full speed over 20 meters distance. That's one of the best ways to activate the hamstrings and the hamstrings do not get enough love in a traditional soccer practice in small sided games. They don't get any love if we're jogging and doing these light movements in our warm up. but hamstrings do build and we build the tolerance of that tissue. If we sprint speed also has improved nutrition and recovery habits. I've had girls in the past show up to speed days they didn't eat breakfast. They did a two hour skills training before they came to the speed session. And they saw that their mile per hour numbers tanked. They suffered because of their poor decisions in nutrition and recovery. So the following week, they decided to come to speed fueled, well slept. They didn't do anything else that day, no other trainings before. And their mile per hour numbers soared. So it really motivated them, okay, maybe I need to start taking care of my health. Maybe I need to add a second recovery day. Maybe I shouldn't be going to bed at 2 a.m. in the summer for off-season workouts. So it, it definitely propels athletes to think about their lifestyle because they don't want their mile per hour to tank. That, that data really motivates them, and there's something to that as well. So you're probably thinking, well, this sounds a little bit crazy. I've never heard this before. Or, you know, we've always done the traditional soccer warm up. You know, why can't we do ladder drills with the ball, then hop over some hurdles and call that speed training? Well, the, the soccer community has failed with speed. And I implore you to think about what you're going to do to really help your players. And that might mean you need to not follow the crowd. So I leave you with this scripture from Matthew 7 verses 3 through 13 through 14. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So are you going to take the narrow gate? And start to implement some of these things? Or are you just going to continue doing what's comfortable and you're going to continue to follow the crowd and you're going to continue to keep your players slow and unhealthy? What are you going to do? So that that concludes the, the presentation part of this. And I, I get asked all the time about uh, my programs. And th these are only for, for athletes who are truly committed and ready for a remote program. I don't recommend remote programs to everyone. They're not for everyone. I don't work with everyone. It's a very small group of athletes who are committed so they're willing to put in the work for the long run. They need to start at three months minimum to really see improvements in their speed. Um, but most, that, most athletes go past that because they, they get excited when they make so much improvement in just a couple months time. But I, athletes who are also self-motivated because when, when you're working out remotely, you're on your own. And I tell my girls, look, the, the point of the program is not for me to coddle you and to keep tabs. If you're doing your workouts, that's on you. You do your job and I do mine. I write the program. I coach you through the movements. I give you video feedback and you're on your own. Your job is to get organized, get these workouts in your routine and stay motivated. And also athletes who realize that there are no quick fixes in this program. So if you want to improve speed in just a week's time, this is not for you. Go, go get a lottery ticket or, or, or do a juice cleanse. <laughs> There's no quick fixes in this program. So I'm definitely looking for athletes who are committed, self-motivated and, and in it for the long run. And I'm, I'm so proud of these girls. So these are two sisters I work with remotely in Ohio. And you see, they got their free lap out for their uh, 10 yard excels and their 10 meter flies. And they're both timing each other. And 
not only that, but they're out here in 16 degree weather getting this in. So it's simple speed training, but it takes commitment and you have to have a relentless attitude to improve it and to truly prioritize it. Not every athlete is willing to do this. Speed's simple, but not everyone's willing to do it. So do you want it? I hope you learn something new. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and just like the video if you enjoyed the presentation and if you're excited about implementing some of these things. And in the caption below, I did include the link to the Speed Queens remote program as well as the free lap timing system and also my website. So you can reach out to me at any point. Thank you guys for listening. And I really hope this helped.